We did a, a woeful job on the boards. There's Trigar, took it to the rack, strong! Larry Davidson! Our bigs had their asses handed to them by Trigar and uh, Davidson. Trigar, the baseline drive, the under reverse, all over it early. To use the Damon Larry quote, why not us, why not now? You know, we believe, this town believes, so uh, we'll have a crack. Born in the crowd will get a shot at his first ever championship. So will Rob Beveridge in game three, the decider. If these guys can't get up to game three, we don't deserve to win a championship. It was pure passion. You know, that, that's, that's passion. That's coming from the heart. It's grand final. This is game three. Just we won. 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 Hello, everybody, and welcome. It is NBL Rewind. Hashtag NBL Rewind to get involved. And if you like Liam Santa Maria and our very special guest and myself, you would have just watched Game 3 of the 2010 NBL Grand Finals series. The Perth Wildcats knock off the Wollongong Hawks. If you haven't watched it yet, get to it. Facebook, Instagram, NBL TV, Twitch, anywhere you find the NBL content, the game is up now. We've got a legend joining us, of course, Sean Reddington in a moment. But hello to you, Liam Santa Maria. Hi, Cam. Yeah, no, I enjoyed going back and, and watching this one. Challenge Stadium going nuts and uh, excited to chew the fat with the scoring machine. The scoring machine, Sean Reddish, mate. And, and of course, not just a legend on court, but now off court as well. You know, working with us in the media as well, doing a fantastic job. How you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's always fun to see those old games and, uh, and relive some of the, those great moments and uh, think about those times when you actually could put the ball back in the hoop. Well, this is a generic question that we ask all our guests. But obviously, in this COVID time, we've had a lot of time at home on the couch. How many times have you gone back and watched the game that you played in over the last couple of months? Have you done it? To be honest, I've n- I haven't really been a big uh, fan of going back and watching, watching those games. I've seen highlights that people will post here and there. Um, but I guess when you've got two young kids, I guess they're mm-hmm. 9 and 12, so not too young. But you don't get a couple hours to uh, sit down and, and watch a full game. And, and they're not interested in seeing um, what their dad used to do. They're, they're more interested in what's happening in their video games. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, before we get to you and your emotions and your memories of it, is there anything that – one big thing that stands out for you, Liam? Because one thing slapped me in the face around this game. Oh, go ahead. Let's One hear massive it. thing. You look at the score, and my memory of it was that Perth won this game in a canter. They won game one fairly comfortably. I think it was double digit, 11 points, 12 points for game two back in Wollongong. Leeds City to Cider. And going into it, my memory is that Perth, you guys just absolutely wiped the floor, which is not even really close to true. This game was won in two minutes at the end of the third quarter. Let's roll it here. 64-63 with 2.10 left on the clock in the third quarter, and then 14 points in two minutes, ultimately ended the championship. And it it surprised me looking back on it that the game was close that late. Sean, yeah, remember well, it that I, way? You know, actually, in, in, the, in the full game too as well, we were, fell behind. I think Wollongong came out and shot the lights out. I mean, we came out with so much energy and passion, and we were trying to press... Um, the way Bevo had us playing that year, you know, Damian Martin, Brad Robbins trying to uh, get up there, full court pressure. Um, and Wollongong was just on fire. And I remember at one stage, I think we were down 12, 15 points thinking, wow, we might be in a little bit of trouble here. Um, and just that, the, you know, they, they were playing extending basketball. But I also kind of felt like there was no way they could keep that up for the full 40 minutes um, in front of a, our home crowd. So uh, it, uh, it, it felt like a bit of a strange game. And you're right, the, the times that I have gone back and watched that one, um, you, you don't realize how close it was in that, in that third quarter before. Really, it was almost a bit of Kevin Lish's coming out party. I mean, he just, it, you know, he dropped down that, that three right at the end of the third quarter. And it was almost like the Michael Jordan moment where you just kind of throw your hands up and everything's going in now and, and we're riding riding high but uh you're right we were in a bit bit of trouble at the start and, and credit to Wollongong they they fought pretty hard in that game three 
We probably should give a shout out to the uh, game clock operator, actually, because you got a head fake, three dribbles, a step back, and was able to hit a shot in 1.3 seconds, which is not easy to do when the clock starts when it's meant to. <laughs> well, they, they say WA stands for wait a while, so I think that's wait a while to start the clock when your team uh, needs a bucket. <laughs> what, are you, what are your memories of that 2010 team, Sean? Because... Um, it wasn't like you guys dominated the regular season. It was a really close, I remember, down, down the stretch heading into the finals. And it felt like you guys were, just, you guys were one of those teams that, that got it going right at the right time of the year. It was. We had so many new pieces to that team as well. Bevo came in. Wildcats almost clean, clean shop. There wasn't too many pieces from the previous year. If I remember right, it was Paul Rogers, uh, which he did only played a little bit a few games, he got injured after game two, I think. And then you had Stephen Way, Brad Robbins, and myself, and then the rest of it were all new players. So it was one of those things, you're coming into the season, I wasn't really sure how good we were gonna be. Um, it took us a little while to find our feet, but even going into the last game of the regular season, we had to win that game. I believe it was versus Townsville mm -hmm. to get top spot. Had we lost that game, we would have finished fourth. Mm -hmm. The way how things were, were um, how close they were in the league at that time. And you're right, there was no dominant team. I don't think that, you know, going into the finals, there was no one that you said that that team is definitely going to win it as you, as you have in previous years. So it, it was a really close competition. It was the first year going to 40 minutes as well. Yeah. Mm. 17 and 11 was your record. 16 and 12, Wollongong. 16 and 12, Townsville. And 16 and 12, the Gold Coast Blaze and made the four teams of the NBL finals. So, of course, you mentioned that, uh, that win in that last round got you the minor premiership and the head-to-head -head played a huge part in home court advantage and, and, and seedings and matchups in that first round of the playoffs. And, yeah, it's a, a decade ago. It's interesting to see the, the Blaze, obviously, in the finals. The Wollongong we've still gotten and towns will know more, unfortunately. But, yeah, a, a mix of them all around the country contesting that NBL championship in the uh, end of the year. Well, someone that people don't realize as well is Wollongong was probably at one stage, I thought they were the best team in the league, but they had Taiwan McKee who got injured mm -hmm. and he was their best player. And I, at that time, he was probably one of their, may, might've been the best import in the league and he was dominating. So um, it could have been a different story had they they'd been uh, healthy as well. The emotions for you, Sean, of, of getting that first title. Um, you'd been at the Wildcats for a little while and, um, done some really good things, but hadn't quite broken through. And, and what, were your, what are your emotions looking back on, on finally getting that ring? Well, I think obviously there, there's the elation of winning. Um, and you know, I hadn't been a part of a, too many championships at that part of my career. So it, it was a bit of a surreal experience. But also being with the Wildcats, there's a lot of relief that goes into that. I mean, there is a lot of pressure to, to win championships. I hadn't won one for almost 10 years there. So, um, you know, and I've been there since 2005 and, and, and gotten beat in the, in the finals every single year. So there, there was a bit of pressure going into that one. And uh, I think probably the fact that we were so young, I mean, you look back at you know, pictures of myself and Damian Martin and, um, you know, we were pretty young, almost a little naive about uh, what we had just achieved. So the, the, it was fun. It, you know, I think the first one's always kind of the sweetest because you, you really haven't tasted being on the top of the mountain. Yeah, you mentioned that pressure, Sean. I, from where we sit and fans ride around the country, it's like you can fast forward the NBL season, any NBL season, and the Wildcats are, are in the playoffs, they're in grand finals, they're winning championships. But when you're obviously living it on a day-to-day -day basis, do you feel the pressure to that added pressure to make sure the expectation which is set right around the country is met? Well, when I first signed, I, I really didn't know the, I guess, the, the history of the Wildcats. Um, in my first season back 2005, we started two and five, if I remember. Um, and Andrew Blahoff was the owner back then. And he came in and gave I'm the biggest spray I've ever seen. I mean, he didn't leave anyone out, um, including the coaches. And, uh, and that was kind of the first time I really saw that <laughs> we got to win. I mean, this is, you know, this isn't recreation basketball. This is professional basketball. And this is you are going to be shipped on the next flight back to the United States unless we start getting some wins on the boards. Wow. Um, 
Jeez, to have been a fly on the wall in that locker room camp. Lala was scary when he was on the court. We were sitting on the couch as 15-year-olds. Imagine him in an owner meeting laying down the law to the crew. Yeah. Right, giving it to Fish too. Oh, yes. Yeah, of course. Fish, myself, Tony Ronaldson, Paul Rogers. I mean, wow. talking about legends of the yeah. game and the club. It was, I, I walked out of there thinking, what have I gotten myself into here? <laughs> Hey, uh, you mentioned Kev Lesh before. Obviously, you know, this was his first season in the league and you and him win the title together. Uh, the great man has hung up the kicks uh, this week. Um, what are your thoughts on his uh, retirement announcement? Look, I was, I was running a session. Uh, this, it would have been on Tuesday and I got, got done with the session in the afternoon. I saw the, the, uh, the email from the NBL saying that Kevin Lish had retired and I was... Um, I was shocked. I, I didn't know that, you know, his injury was that bad. He obviously he played in the finals and gave him a call straight away. And, he, you know, he seemed to uh, seem to be okay with it. And uh, was kind of knowing that it was going to be at that stage, you know, probably in December, he kind of knew that that was going to be his last season. So, um, you know, I, for a guy, I, I, you know, I obviously thought he could still play for a number of years, but you know, just an incredible career, incredible teammate, incredible friend, you know, all the people that have come out and said such nice things about him. It's all true. I mean, you know, he uh, came over here and, and had, did some incredible things with the Wildcats. So we, we played together over in Puerto Rico, won a championship over there. Probably one of my favorite uh, moments playing basketball and, and winning a, a title over there is for a, for a small town, Cabo Diaz. And uh, being able to share that with him, and you know, I was I was devastated when he left the Wildcats. I tried as hard as I could to uh, convince him that, you know, things aren't very good over in Europe. You got to stay in Australia. But um, you know, he's uh, he, he's really proud of what he's been able to do in his career and how he's been able to achieve things. And um, you know, proud to call him a teammate and a friend as well. He joined us on NBL Overtime on Tuesday night to, to speak about his career, of course, and, and everything going forward. And he, he touched on that first season and he got here and he was like speaking about the fact that they get up to, I think you're up at uh, Darwin at the uh, preseason tournament and homicides in his ear. And he's saying he's just this naive, you know, new import trying to find his way. And he struggled earlier than he hit a big three in towns all game winner and it sort of set him on his way and stopped him from getting chipped back I think were his exact words uh when there's some trouble well when a new import comes in and we'll we'll focus with Kevin Lee here um how hard is it to be able to sort of see there and see someone struggling know how much pressure they're under while also trying to find the right balance of incorporating them in to the team as well as not losing too much of me I guess focus on one guy as as because you got you got to find form fast don't you for an import yeah, you do. And I'll give, I'll give Bevo some credit with that. Um, you know, he really believed in Kevin Lish, um, but he also pushed him. So Kevin, you know, I think he was, he's such a team player and he had been on, you know, good teams in college and never needed to kind of be that go-to guy. But, you know, when you're coming over and you're an import, you're expected to put up some, some numbers. Um, the coach had never told me I needed to put up more shots. They're probably the opposite. But, um, you know, just to encourage Kevin to uh, be a, a little bit more aggressive. And when he was, he saw that. And uh, so I give credit to, to Bevo for really seeing that in him. If he could push Kevin that, uh, you know, and, and be more aggressive, that uh, it was going to help the team and ultimately help himself as well. And, um, you know, once he kind of got that, that, you know, we need you to kind of go out there and be the man. Um, he was, and he did a, a fantastic job. And, you know, I've spoken to uh, Cam Glidden the other day, and he, I asked him, uh, you know, who the best players he's played in the in the NBL is, and he mentioned Kevin Lish in, in his prime and, and Bryce Cotton. So uh, I was pretty lucky to play with both of them, and uh, I think he's probably spot on. One more question about Kev before we before we move on, because I mean there are a few people who could speak on him uh, as well as you can. Um, you talk about what a great teammate he wa he was and what a great guy he is. But for for all those people that have never been inside a, a Perth Wildcats locker room or at a practice session or have had a, maybe have never had a conversation with Kev Lish, lift the curtain a little bit on what it was that made him such a great teammate. Just so down to earth. I mean, it, you would not know if the guy had 40 points or he had five. And, you know, the next day and you come down to, you know, he's interested in 
how your family's doing. I, he's one of those guys you can call up and you don't feel like if you haven't talked to him for six months, you feel like you're just instantly connected with him straight away. You haven't, um, you haven't missed a beat. And, uh, you know, I think he, 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 there's, there's teammates that you just say, I'll do anything for, and he's one of them. So um, if you can think about, you know, the nicest aunt and uncle you have, that, that's Kevin Lish. <laughs> right. So he's kind of like the opposite to Cam. He's, <laughs> he's a good guy. Fair enough, too. Someone, someone tweeted that the other day when I said some nice things about Kev Lish, and then someone said the opposite to you. I said, no, fair enough. You've yeah. it. Hey, there's about a million Kevin Lish games where you can go back and watch and, yeah. and see the impact he has. And, and this is one of them. You, you mentioned earlier, Sean, you're 11 down in the second quarter, a little bit of unease in Challenge Stadium, and he gets aggressive, takes it to the rack, gets a layup, gets fouled, hits a pretty big three, and, and, and things turn. And then the end of that third quarter as well where – he hits a couple of big threes as well and extends that lead to what was that mouth uh, when he, uh, watering sort of and, and winning uh, margin is the words I'm looking for. But yeah, so anyone out there who might not have seen a great deal of Kevin Lynch, I'd be surprised. But if you want to see him turn almost single-handedly a game, this is the perfect one because he does it in his particular second and third quarters. Well, and he also, the thing about him is he always hit big shots. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, there's guys that you want the ball in his hands to uh, to make a play, Kevin Lish is one of them, and you, you saw that in his, it was his second or third game in the NBL. But just seemed, that he, you know, he didn't shy away from the moment. And uh, you know, I was I was fortunate to play with him in, in Puerto Rico, and we played this Grand Final series. And I think every play we we play, we were playing against a pretty good team. We just put the ball in his hands. He just made the right play. It's a bit like Bryce Cotton as well. You just you know the right play is going to happen. If, uh, and he never felt like he forced it. So I think it's an ultimate compliment to him. And, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, congratulations on a, an incredible career. And I think we're all lucky we're able to uh, watch him for so long. I'll tell you what, so you mentioned Sorry, Kay, since you mentioned Bevo, we talked about Fish before. Mm -hmm. uh, Fish, Connor Henry, Bevo, Trevor Gleason. Who, who was your favorite? Ooh. Look, that's uh, good question. <laughs> that's like picking <laughs> picking your 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 favorite kid. Come on, but man. they all had different styles about them. You yeah, know, we know I, that. I feel... What we don't know is who was your favorite. Yeah. <laughs> Look, one one thing I liked about um, I like really liked the up tempo system that Bevo had us playing. Yeah. You know, if I looked back on probably my favorite time of playing was when we were just full court pressing. I think right. we had the, the person that it was just a fun way to play. And I think we brought that in and um, you know, so I think for me that was the style of play. Um, but I think I was pretty fortunate to play for some, some incredible coaches that were successful and, and taught me a lot about the game and about life as well. Incredibly well answered. Incredibly well <laughs> yeah. answered there. I, I was just going to mention uh, Martin Catalini. Uh, of course, uh, veteran, late, real late in his career in this particular series, in this particular season, but an Australian basketball legend and boomers and big numbers across the NBL for such a long period of time. Just, just talk, he's one of my favourites of all time. I, lo I love Martin Catalini as a player. He's, he's, he's great to chat to in these senses as well. Just your memories of Martin Catalini and playing with him. Well, uh, you know, when I came into the league, he was, he was kind of in his prime. He'd just come back from Europe. I mean, he some games he was just unstoppable. He just, just a pure score. And, you know, even against a guy like Sam McKinnon, who was probably one of the better defenders the league has ever had. And he, he's scoring 40, 50 points on, on guys like that. So it's just a, a pure score, but even that season, you know, he was, that was his last season in the league. If you came to some of our trainings, you would have said Martin Catalini was our best player. I mean, there was just some trainings where he was just on fire. He'd catch the ball in that mid post and, it was, it was just a bucket. There was nothing you could do to, to stop him. So um, he was, he, he was important in that regard for, especially for Stevie way, you know, Stevie way was starting, but Martin Kennelly could come in and, and kind of, you need one of those guys that come in and just instantly get points, especially when you're struggling. Um, I remember a game against New Zealand where I think he had 17 in the fourth quarter and just got us over the line. And if you look back on a season, I mean, that one win in New Zealand gets us top spot, which <laughs> Wildcats don't lose in the finals at home. So it's just those little things that go into being successful that uh, you look back on a season and you're thankful to have a guy like that on your team. All right, let's so look let's look at, sorry, I was going to say, let's talk about how you got to Perth. Mm. Because, um, you know, you're one of those guys that is, is held up as 
um, somebody who came over here to play at the lower level and then goes on not only to play in the NBL, but to become an all-time great of the league. You know, there's not a lot. I mean, you go way back, you know, and it's like uh, guys like Bruce Bolden, you know, comes over the Gippsland Lakers and then gets picked up to the, to the Eastside Spectres and goes from there. But in this kind of more modern era, it, it doesn't happen to that level, really. Um, tell us about the remarkable journey from Tassie to New Zealand to Bendigo to Perth. Yeah, I think, I think you're right, Liam. I think you do get pigeonholed. You know, if you come over and you start yourself in that second division, coaches kind of view you as a second division player. Um, and I remember that being my goal coming out here to, when I started with Northwest Tassie about trying to play NBL. I was probably a bit naive in, in thinking that, that that is an actual real possibility. But I was just thankful I had a job. That was the only offer I had when I came out to – to play in Tassie and and then you know you go to New Zealand things didn't work out there they were um, you know they were a new club and and they they wanted to try and win and probably needed to make a change to see if they could save their season um, when I was released there so it's a, it's an interesting story when I was in Bendigo though because a couple things happened that probably a lot of viewers may not may not know um, Townsville was actually going to sign me. And uh, they were talking to the, my coach, Wayne Larkins, um, Ian Stacker at the time. And, and Wayne Larkins calls me up one night and he said, look, I just had a good chat with, with Townsville. Um, they they, they, they want to sign you or, and uh, they're going to give you a call tonight. And I never heard anything. And so, uh, so I, don't, I never really got the full story what happened there. But um, a few weeks later, I was traveling down to uh, – we're trying to think we we're playing a game in Knox and the uh, coach Wayne Lark has brought me forward. He said, look, um, I just get a call from the Wildcats. They want to bring you over for a trial. I guess one of their players, one of the college guys, Lucas Walker was coming over for a trial. Um, but he decided to go back to college. So at that time, the finances of the Wildcats wasn't where it probably is today. Um, they didn't want to waste a plane ticket. So they had this ticket from Melbourne to Perth, but well, let's just bring, Sean over so I played the game that night drove back got up at like 4 a.m. to drive back to the the airport to catch the early morning flight and uh, came over here for a three-day trial um, and I guess uh, haven't really left ever since. So I think something that really helped you when you got to Australia is that well when you put up big numbers in the in the Siebel in particular you played on really good teams like Northwest Tasmania you know that national final that you just got pipped by Cairns and then you win a national championship when you're at uh, at Bendigo so it wasn't like you were just putting up 30 and 20 in teams and they were going 6 and 16 you were in big games winning big tournaments or big conferences and then big titles so I think that really helps I think sometimes people overlook that a little bit but when, when big players put up big numbers and the team is winning there's no doubt it helps in the eyes of recruiters I think yeah it's a, it's a good point because I think you you, you are you are, I talked about earlier, you are pigeonholed, but I think if you are going to make that leap, you have to put up really good numbers, but your team also has to win. Mm. Um, you know, I think you've seen too many guys that come out and get the ball's in their hands the whole time, but their team's not winning. Um, it, it, you know, and, and the reality is if you go from that second division to first division to the NBL, you're, you're probably going to be more of a role player anyways. Um, so you've got to be able to fit into that and figure out your niche. So it was uh, one of the things I guess I am proud of is, is being able to be on winning teams and, and be successful teams because to me that's the ultimate mark of a great player. Well, was that Bendigo <laughs> team, the one where Ben Harvey hit the most remarkable game winner of all time in a national <laughs> semifinal? Was that, was that your team? Yes, that was that was my team and Ben Harvey. If you know him, he will tell you about it every time. Every time I see him, he's the first thing he said. Remember that when I banked in that shot? It was amazing. That, that game was actually against Marcus Timmons, who, it was against uh, who game, replaced right? me at um, yeah at, at at the New Zealand Breakers. So there were some interesting uh, matchups there as well. <laughs> you talk about being on successful teams and winning. I mean, you. Yeah, the Wildcats, 34 straight trips to the finals. You and your, you played, what, like a dozen years for the Wildcats and you never missed the finals, you know, winning a whole bunch of championships. Which single season Wildcats team that you played on was the best? Yeah, and don't be oh, diplomatic this time, Sean. That's an easy one. I'm sure you guys can probably uh, 
the uh, 2013-14 with James Ennis, mm -hmm. you know, Jermaine Beal, Damian Martin. I mean, that that team, uh, you know, I think we started, was it 12-1? and one? We, um, it's the most talented team. I remember walking after a training session. I was, somehow I got matched up with James Ennis that day and just walking back and telling Damian Martin in the locker room, he is good. <laughs> he is good. I, I, you know, I'll, I usually, when the imports come out, I'll try and challenge them and see how they respond. I, I didn't know how to guard him. I didn't know what to do. He either dunked on me, hit a three. I was, I felt like I was out on an Island out there. And, uh, and I just walked away just thinking, and in the way we play, we just had a, you know, he was uh, an NBA player. We're lucky to have him for that one season. How much, how much fun is that? Like you, the game we obviously just watched 2010, it's a tight season and there's intrigue and drama. And if you win this game, you're here. If you're losing, you fall down here. And there's a lot to be said from a fan watching that. But when you're part of a team that good, that talented, and you probably have a, a real confidence level that wherever you go into whatever gym, you know, either Australia or New Zealand, you're going to leave with the W. What's that feeling like? It's, you know, I guess I never really allowed myself to kind of think I was going to walk out of the gym with, with a W. I had experienced so many losses and, and I knew how tough the league was. But there, yeah, there was a sense of aura about that team that when we walked in, I knew I looked over Jermaine Beal was going to knock down the threes and we just had that right chemistry. Um, obviously an elite talent in James Ennis, but then everyone else was, was you know, Matty Knight was was a beast down there and, and Jesse Wagstaff. I mean, some of the games he come off the bench, I think he had 25 one one game against the Sydney Kings single-handedly destroyed them. And, and that's, that's a guy coming off the bench, you know, you just had that, that talent, but uh, it was, it was a fun season. And uh, you know, it, it, by far, that was the best team I played on. Uh, James Ennis or Bryce Cotton. In, in what context? <laughs> if you, you, you're a GM, yeah. the Wildcats, Ooh. At that, that you obviously you you came in mm -hmm. in your final season, mm -hmm. Bryce, and helped take you guys from the street to the suite <laughs> to the title. Um, James, you spoke about how good he was and how influential he was on that year. I mean, at both the, and with Bryce, it wasn't just that year, right? Like you've been able to watch him from the sidelines do his thing year after year. Like who, at their peak, would be the guy you'd want on your team? If I'm building a team, mm -hmm. I'm going to build it around Bryce Cotton because he just makes so much everyone else so, so much better. I mean, uh, he, you know, it, it, it still blows me away that a guy like that can lead the league in scoring. And I've watched him play over 100 games now. I've never felt like he's pressing. Never right. felt like he's taking bad shots. Like every shot he takes, you're like, that's a good shot. Right. It's a good shot. Or, you know, you could see – in the final series two years ago where they just double teamed him and he passed off and, and yeah. Tariqo White, and he's the happiest guy coming off the, off the court. It didn't, didn't worry him that Tariqo White won the, the finals MVP, you know, they got the championship. So he's a rare breed in that. And uh, you know, I think he's, he's a rare talent that he can make everyone else around him better. And uh, I know the, the red army is pretty excited that uh, he's going to be back for, for three more years now. Did they have to rattle some tins the last couple of weeks to be able to get him to sign the deal? Is he on the streets with the Wildcats logo or anything, mate? Yeah, they. Uh, I actually wasn't. I was surprised there wasn't more uh, more people walking around. Uh, you know, I probably would have been the first one out there trying to uh, rattle the tins as well because uh, I, I love him as a player, and you know, it would have been a huge loss for the league. And and I kind of felt like he's at that stage now, whereas he if he leaves. And probably a little bit where Kevin Lish was as well, where either they're here or they're not, you know, they're going to go away and you kind of, you might come back. But now I feel like he can submit, really cement his, his legendary status here with the Wildcats. And, and hopefully he can finish, finish his career because I, I, you know, I think he's tasted Europe and, you know, barring an NBA offer, you know, I think uh, it kind of be that next line of, of, of the Wildcat greats that have stayed here for a long time. You probably can't put it down to just one thing, Sean, but what would, what would, how would you describe what it is that makes the Wildcats so successful as an organization? You know, a guy who played that, you know, that 12 years or so there and has been around the organization ever since, uh, 
you've had a bunch of different coaches, you've had a bunch of different players, you've had uh, different owners. Um, I'm sure it's a percentage of, of ownership and the fan support. And, but, but what do you think is probably the, the biggest key that separates that organization from everybody else? I, I, you know, I probably, I think the Red Army doesn't get as much credit as they, as they deserve. You know, I think when you're traveling four or five hours to play over in WA, and then you got to rock up and play in front of, and even at Challenge Stadium, when it was packed, I mean, that was a tough place to play. And, and some people actually even think that was tougher than, than RAC Arena these days. But, and then you've got to, you know, you've got to win in front of 13,000 fans. So I think there's a, a big key in that. And there's a bit of pride, you know, when you put on that, that jumper and being a part of WA that uh, you kind of feel like it, you're up against the, the East Coast and, and New Zealand and you're trying to uh, gain a little bit of respect. Um, and then I think the, the last part is just the character of the guys that they recruit. I mean, you see some guys – um, you, you don't always know until they, they actually arrive, but uh, the ones that uh, really fit into the culture, you know, I think they, uh, they try and keep them long term. And then that really helps. I mean, you can, you know, if you've got a strong culture, you've got Damian Martin as your leader. Well, you know, it's going to, even if you've got one that's kind of got one foot in, one foot out, they're, they're going to really buy in because um, it's hard to uh, say no to that small. <laughs> <laughs> what you, you mentioned, uh, obviously having to fly three, four hours or uh, New Zealand or even Cairns a little bit longer and having to deal with that. But how do you find the travel? When, you, when you're a professional athlete in Western Australia and you've got to go to the east side and the east seaboard and all the rest of it, how do you individually and personally find jumping on a plane as much as you had to do and, and the long trips? Well, it's, it is an adjustment. It is tough. Oh, uh, you know, the first couple of years, I, I, you know, we didn't win as many times on the road. Probably our team wasn't as good. Mm -hmm. Um, but also you, you, you adjust to it. And I think because you are flying on a weekly basis, you kind of get used to it. Whereas other teams are only coming out West once or twice yeah. a year. So they're not used to that long travel, mm -hmm. having to back themselves up and, and being able to, um, play at that high level, because even at five, 10% down from your best, it's going to be tough to get a win in the NBL these days. So it's, uh, you know, I think they, they put a lot of emphasis on it. But, uh, you know, I always found going back was the hard part. And maybe that's why where there's a bit of advantage because, you, you know, you got the strong headwinds, five hours from Sydney. That extra hour just seems to uh, drag on forever okay. sometimes. Hey, Liam, put the pressure on you about best coach, best wildcat you play with, all the rest of it. Best opponent in the NBL and you've matched up against you. You mentioned obviously Martin Catalini when you first started, but you the best and toughest opponent, one that you knew if you rolled in, it was going to be a hell of a 40 minutes. Oh, that's probably an easy one as well. Mika Bacona. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've had some good battles, obviously, you know, I really enjoyed playing against Mark Worthington, although we, uh, you know, we butted heads. I think there was a, a mutual respect in, in, and how hard each of us played, but uh, you know, Mika Vakona, and I was I was actually privileged to to be his teammate in New Zealand, and kind of saw him. You know, at that time he was kind of a three man, just get a rebound, and and you know they did the right thing and put him at that four spot. But he, he just, I love those challenges where you knew there was no playoff. You know, it was going to be one of those things. It was going to be forty minutes, and you know, big credit to him and and why the New Zealand Breakers had that stretch. It's uh, yeah. You know, and one of the other guys that probably doesn't get mentioned and, and one of my favorite teammates and, and the toughest to play against was Dylan Boucher. You know, the way he, he, the way he can affect a game by not even scoring, a little bit like Damian Martin was, was really unique. And, and I have a, a great appreciation for, for those guys and the way they play and can affect games in, in that regard. I'd almost say, Liam, almost certainly, the way that Wertho and, and Sean play, they probably literally – Bumped heads a couple of occasions while on court, I reckon, the way they went at it. <laughs> For sure. Sean, you've got the jersey on the wall behind you there. I want to read this to you. This is from Chris Robinson wrote this on Perth Now, March 5, 2017, just after you won that, that title. He wrote, come next summer when the Wildcats raise their eighth banner into the rafters, Redditch's number 42 singlet will be heading up there to join it. Three, does, three years later... Does it irk you that it's not up there yet? Oh, look, you, you, you know, you go to that arena and you see those jerseys that are up there. There's a tremendous amount of respect. Um, it's one of those things. Look, if it happens, I'll be extremely uh, 
crowd and uh, it'll be, you know, uh, one of the highlights of, of my, my, I guess, career. And, um, you know, I think for me though, it's, it's those titles are the, are the biggest, biggest things. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm embedded in the, the community here and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just, we'll just have to see. I, I don't think it's a player's prerogative. You know, I think that's a, that's an owner's, that's the fans, that's, um, that's the thing. It's, it's never been my, my thing to uh, say yes, no, how I feel. I'll just say if it happens, it, it'd be a huge honor. You know, you look at, uh, you know, I love, love my Tom at the Wildcats and a uh, tremendous amount of respect for the jerseys that are up there. Yeah, so, well, it's up to us then, Liam, isn't it? It's not if, it's when, right? It's when. Cam, yeah, what's when? the hold-up? I don't know. I don't know what the hold-up is. And it's, we're not just saying this because Sean's here, because we had this conversation yes. uh, led by Corey Homicide Williams in, in some small part as well, around a month ago in NBL overtime. So uh, we understand very – now we know you're in the media, mate, when you answer so great questions like that, so it's <laughs> diplomatically. But from where we sit, it's when, not if. I think anyway, Liam. I think you'll yeah. agree. Yeah, well, for sure, for sure. And mm. what, there's why delay? As Chris, as Chris okay. Robinson wrote on that day, yeah. there was no reason to delay then. There's been no reason to delay ever since. Get that thing up there. Yep, nah, agreed. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> we won't, we Thanks, won't guys. I appreciate more the short. kind words. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's behind me at the moment, yes. so uh, they'll have to come take it. Um, we... Mate, you do a wonderful job in the media. We'll talk about your podcast in a moment, but you still, of course, we see your courtside in, in NBL games as part of that coverage at different times as well. How do you enjoy it? How do you enjoy being a part of the media and, and being so close to the action and still being involved on game night? Look, I think as a, as a player, you, you, you really miss that adrenaline, um, that competitiveness, but I didn't know how much I would love it. I mean, I go to the get, I get excited when I'm getting to the game and, you know, sit next to Hamasad and, and Lockie Reed and, and we can have a, you know, a good chat about what's happening out there on the court. And I just kind of feel like this is, this is great. I mean, sitting courtside, I'm watching the best players in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and an interesting one, that one game where there was no fans in the finals mm -hmm. and you can just hear everything going on and Bogut's yelling at, at Trevor Gleason to put in Jesse Wagstaff because he just dunked on Miles Plumley, you know, it was that that part was fun, and um, you just get to see a different side, you know. Even this year, getting to go into the huddles and just seeing how different coaches, um, you know, obviously you get that in the TV, but to actually be there in person and go back and forth, and um, I, I I can understand why you guys love it as well. It's uh, it, it really is, uh, you know, you just kind of feel like you're. And, and the good thing is, you, you get to still be a part of it and. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, a lot of the guys out there on the court. So I, I actually find it uh, really fun. And um, it's something that uh, you know, you're never going to replace playing, but it, it's, it's pretty close. Did, did you miss Corey this year? I did. I did. We, we, we have a lot of fun with it. And it's, uh, you know, I think hopefully it comes through on, on the TV. But we uh, really enjoyed sitting there courtside and, and just feeling like we're, you know, we're having a bit of a, a yawn and, and banter back and forth and, while we're watching incredible athletes get up and down. Because you were a part of that game when Homicide ripped off his jersey and we, he made us do it on NBL Rewind a couple of weeks ago. So <laughs> what, what were your thoughts of Homicide back then compared to obviously the man you work with a little bit now and, and have that relationship with? Yeah, well, we, we probably butted heads on the court <laughs> as well. And, you know, that that New York uh, toughness with him and the, the Nebraska Cornhusker and me, uh, we didn't, we didn't like each other on the, on the court that, that much. And especially when he, he knocked us out of the finals, John really hitting 10 threes, mm. homicide hitting jumpers. I mean, he never hit jumpers mm. and uh, <laughs> you know, it was um, <laughs> you know, credit to them. They, they, they played an incredible game and uh <laughs> you know, the thing about Corey is if he won, he was going to let you know. And he let yeah. the entire uh, Challenge Stadium know they had just beaten us. Um, one thing you or the Wildcats as a whole have never been able to do is win the three-peat, mm. right? And, you know, it's, you know, the Breakers have done it, the Kings. You guys have gone back-to-back -back a couple of times. The team's going to have the opportunity to go after that again this year, Bryce back on deck. We wait to hear what happens with Nick Kay. We're waiting to hear word from, from Damian Martin. Um, what do you think is going to be the key to, to getting that done? Well, there's so many factors that go into winning a championship. But 
you know, I think Nick Kay is is, is going to be a huge piece if they can get him. He's he's I know he's highly rated, but I also kind of feel like he's underrated. <laughs> you know, he's been all NBL the last two seasons, but just the little things that he does out on the court that uh, that doesn't always get recognized. I love him as a player and just the way he's uh, he's improved since he, he's arrived. So I think it'll be a big key for them to get him if they can. Uh, to be able to go get that three-peat. And, you know, people are going to be gunning for him. I mean, Sydney Kings are going to be a different team. I thought they were probably one of the most talented teams I'd ever seen um, this past season. So, uh, you know, they, they've lost Kevin Lish and Andrew Bogut and a few of the other guys as well. We don't know what's going to happen with Casper Ware. So, it's, uh, you know, it's going to be an interesting league and only two imports of the fact. I, and we still don't know if Bryce Cotton could get that, that citizenship and – you got to feel like if he gets that citizenship, which I'm guessing the rest of the league is, is hoping he doesn't, um, that, that'll make them a, a lot tougher as well. But it, there's so many things. It, I think a lot of it has to go down to being healthy as well. So if they can keep their stars healthy, I think that it'll give them a great chance. You know, there is Australian basketball fans right now torn because Bryce Cotton gets that citizenship. He's a chance to play for the Boomers. It makes them better. And closer to that elusive medal at a major championship. And the Wildcats get another import. So if you are a Cats right. type fans fan, or you're a Bullets fan, you're a Kings fan, you're like, yeah, I kind of don't know. I want this way to go because it definitely makes it so much better. It's not only that, Cam. It's that um, like the whole rest of the league for all those competitive reasons, mm. but it's the luxury tax. Yeah, oh, yes. That, that flows onto all the yeah, other teams. Mm -hmm. He becomes a citizen. He goes into a marquee slot. Mm -hmm. And Jack doesn't have to pour that into the to the pockets of all the other, other teams. all those other clubs. It's absolute game changer in a whole bunch of ways. <laughs> and which, of course, it was for you, Sean. Yeah. You know, and the and the Wildcats have had so much success mm -hmm. with that process over the years, right? Like you get there in in '05, and then what? A couple of years later, later in '08, mm -hmm. you get you get naturalized, and now they've got the scoring machine plus all these other guys, and that's when you start rattling off championships. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been a recipe for success for them. Um, and it feels like they're replicating it again with, with Bryce. And uh, I'm actually surprised other teams don't go down that route a little bit more. Once you get a guy that you know fits into your culture and your system, uh, you know, they, they asked me to get my citizenship and if I was willing to stay after my first year. Mm. So, um, and I was, you know, I was thankful I had a job. So I was like, yes, this is, you know, and I'm, I'm down at the beach here and, and enjoying life, not having to be in the cornfields of Nebraska and uh, thinking I'm, this is where I'm going to be for the rest of my life. So it's, uh, it's one of those things where I'm actually surprised more teams don't go down that route a little bit more and, and because it has been a successful uh, recipe for the Wildcats. I feel like, Cam, every t so many games we've gone back and watched this offseason in NBL Rewind, I've had a, had a moment where I'm like, hold on, who were the imports? Mm on this team that won this championship, which I go back and I was a, it was a tiny pender, James Crawford, Ricky Grace, Pete Hansen. And it's like, hold on, which two of those guys were naturalized? Like it's been such an, a key element to so many championship teams. Yeah. And if, if they get it done with Bryce, like this thing just becomes ridiculous. But as you touched on, Sean, this is 100% a credit to the organization, the yes. Perth Wildcats, who over the course of the years have been like, well, okay. And it helps a little bit sometimes when you have that success, which adds to the confidence, which you back yourself in to be, you know, successful year in, year out, but which might allow them to take a slight risk here that another one might not be willing to take. But you're right. Every single, every single generation, every single decade, there seems to be a superstar that gets naturalized, which adds to the team, which leads to a championship. Yeah, it's a... Uh... It, and the thing is, Australia is such a, a beautiful country, New Zealand as well, that <laughs> these guys that come out here, if, they, if they've experienced some tough situations in Europe where they haven't been paid, it's why people love it here. So I think it's, uh, it's something that uh, can, can happen a, a lot more. They, they made that process a lot tougher than when I first got here. Um, but I still think it's, uh, it's something that uh, there's a, you look at what's happening in the round of the rest, the rest of the world. I think Australia is one of the better places to be at the moment. No doubt. And, and, hey, talk about sliding doors moment, just on this topic of naturalized, because I think it was such an important element of Sean's career, right? Like the fact that that happened and, um, it, and that the team was able to build those other players around you. Sliding doors moment, 
the Brisbane Bullets were this close to getting that situation with Tory Craig. And then he gets picked up by the Nuggets in that off season and he hasn't looked back and has been playing in the NBA. That, I mean, we could have been talking about a couple of Brisbane Bullets yeah. titles in these last couple of years if that hadn't happened. Yeah, that's an interesting one. And, and you talk about Torrey Craig. That's, you know, when he was at Cairns, I, he was good, but I didn't think he was NBA starting material. Yeah. There's mm-hmm. games where he's starting in NBA and putting up good minutes and numbers. So I, it's, I think it's a huge credit to how tough this league is. I mean, he was, he was backing up Stephen Way a couple of years later. He's in the NBA. <laughs> so it's a, it's a, it's a credit to, to the talent. And it's something, you know, I've probably been fortunate to, to be here uh, in 05 and now see where it is now. It's um, the talent level we have in this league. I know we say it each year and we mm-hmm. say it, but it is pretty, pretty spectacular. I mean, there's some games I'm watching. I'm like, I don't even know if I'd get on the court, you know, back in my prom with, with the way the, how good these guys are and how athletic and, and how exceptional their skills are. I'm fairly confident you'd still be able to play a couple of minutes late, Sean, on any team in the NBL right now in your prime. Hey, just on Tory Craig, he played big minutes, starting minutes for a really good team too in Denver over there. So it's not like he just wanders in and plays for a lower team. All right, before I let you go, mate, your podcast. Is it still cracking along in that we've had the enforced break? Tell us a little bit about your podcast and give it a plug. Yeah. Well, we're really enjoying that side of it. We're, uh, we've actually uh, been cranking out some, you know, having a little bit more time uh, to be able to crank out some more basketball hustle. Um, you can check us out. Me and Pikey get, uh, get into Australian basketball. We've got some good interviews there. We're, we're hoping to have Kevin Lish coming up. But we, we had a good chat with Tim Conrad last week and uh, interesting on the three-on-three side of things. And just, I guess, just trying to dive into guys – careers a little bit deeper than we always get uh, just on the sidelines on, on the NBL. So basketball hustle, if you want to check it out and uh, yeah, just enjoying uh, still being able to be a part of basketball and, and I guess bring in some of it as you guys are doing now, you got a little bit more time and can kind of get it more in depth to people's stories and, and what makes them tick. And on that, we've had an absolute pleasure as always, mate, having a chat to you, reminiscing around this game. If you haven't seen it, 2010 Game 3 Grand Final, the Wildcats and the Hawks, jump on NBL TV, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, wherever you want to get it. Check it out right about now. Sean, of course, plays a big part in getting his first of four championships at the Perth Wildcats. Mate, as always, appreciate your time. We're looking forward to us linking back up when the season starts and working together towards NBL 21. Look forward any time. And uh, when you got Corey on there as well, love to uh, have a good little yawn with, all, with you all. <laughs> done. Consider it done. Hashtag NBL where you want to get involved. NBL Overtime back next Tuesday. Liam Santamaria, thank you. Thanks, man. Thanks, Sean. Yeah.